All right, testing. Uh, just so I don't have to stand right next to that, let me get my clicker. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about C++, uh, so a language that many of you know and love. Uh, many of you know. Uh, but I'm going to talk about new stuff in C++. Now, new here is within the past seven years or so, but C++ has undergone some pretty major changes. So nothing breaking backwards compatibility too much, but adding a lot of new things that you can do, a lot of new ways to do things that you could do before. I'm not going to get into anywhere near all of the new stuff in C++. That would take a three or four hour talk. Uh, so I'll just go over some of the highlights and then point you to some places you can get some more information. Uh, so I'll start out by talking a little bit about what C++ is. I'm going to assume most people here have at least seen Done, uh, seen C++ and done a little bit of C++ programming. Uh, and I'll also talk about the history of C++ standards and uh, where these new standards came from. And then a few new features, uh, just five here, but there are dozens to hundreds, depending on how you count them, and then point you to some more information. Uh, so C++, uh, many people think of it as being an object-oriented programming language. And the uh, developers of C++, the standards committee of C++, will slap your hand for saying that. It's a general purpose programming language that supports object-oriented programming, but doesn't require it. If you wanted to write C code, normal procedural code with functions and so on in C++, you can do that. If you want to write uh, generic programs that can generate code based on different types, you can do that. If you want to write object-oriented programs, you can do that. And more and more with the new standards, if you want to write a functional program, the kind you might write in Lisp, for example, you can do that as well. Uh, so a couple of guiding principles of C++ are uh, that you don't pay for what you don't use. Uh, so things that people have proposed for the standards have often been rejected because this would cause a slight overhead to every program uh, that's compiled in C++. If it causes only an overhead to programs that use that feature, that's okay. If you want to use it, you can pay for it. Uh, but this is very important when deciding what does and doesn't go into C++. It's intended to be a very efficient language. And another part of that is this idea of zero overhead abstractions. That you should be able to uh, define new types or define new ways of doing things that don't give don't have any additional overhead compared to the kind of manual way of doing it. So, uh, for example, when I talk about lambdas a little bit later, uh, they can compile down basically into uh, basically into normal functions, and they don't really have any overhead beyond what's absolutely necessary in order to use them. Uh, and I'm going to talk again mostly about the features or entirely about the features of C++ and up, but with occasional looking back to how you had to do these things in the older versions. So C++ is a pretty old language. Not as old as C, but uh, not that much newer than C. Uh, the Arnie Strewstrip started developing it in the late 70s, and uh, originally it was just a preprocessor for C, called C with classes. Uh, it was influenced by the Simula language, which was one of the first object-oriented programming languages. Uh, in 1985, uh, AT&T decided we're going to release C++ to the public. It's not just going to be this internal pro uh, project, but we think other people will be able to use it and other people will be willing to pay us money for it. Uh, that was also the year that the first edition of the C++ programming language, uh, the book that's kind of the Bible of C++, was released. Uh, the international standard came about 13 years later, in 1998. Uh, we had the ISO, uh, that's the International Organization for Standardization, and IEC, International Electrotechnical Commission, standard uh, bunch of numbers, which we usually nowadays refer to as C++ 98. So uh, this had most of the features that, uh, that you've probably encountered and used in C++, unless you have 
been doing some new modern C++ in the last seven years. Uh, in 2003, there was a new standard, but it wasn't really much in the way of new. Uh, it was really just bug fixes to the original standard, things that were maybe a little bit underspecified, uh, maybe a couple of additional library routines that uh, that were inadvertently missing or that they didn't even realize they needed, and so on. Uh, so the, that's also an ISO standard. Uh, you can tell from these, the, uh, the name of the standard just takes this number and adds the year. So in 2011, so eight years after that bug fix release and 13 years after the last real uh, standard for C++, there was a huge revision to C++ called C++11. So if someone talks about modern C++, they usually mean C++11 and up. Um, so this uh, release of the language took a long time. It was originally in development called C++ OS because they were planning on releasing it nah, maybe 2008, 2009, and then 2009 rolled around to 2010 and they realized C++ OX wasn't a good name. So it became C++1X, and then they did manage to release it in 2011. Uh, it, this version of the language is still almost entirely backwards compatible with C++. The main places where it's not are, well, if you, uh, if you have a name for a function or a variable that is one of the new keywords in C++, okay, that might break. Uh, or if you're using something that has been deliberately removed. Uh, for example, the getS function. Uh, notorious, notoriously bad interface in C uh, for reading a string, putting it into an array, and it has no way of knowing whether it has a buffer overflow or no way to avoid uh, doing a buffer overflow. So getS was removed in, uh, I think it was deprecated around C++03 and then finally removed in C++11 or C++14. So if you use that, yeah, your program's not backwards compatible, or your program won't work with the new standard, but then again, your program didn't work right in the first place. Uh, so C++11 took so long to come out that uh, people were kind of worried, okay, how long is it going to be before we have another standard? But the standards committee realized that this had been a problem and started pushing for more clockwork releases. So uh, C++14, it was originally called C++1Y, the one that came after 1X, came out in 2014. And based on how long it took to standardize that and uh, so on, they decided that, uh, well, we'll try for a new release every three years. So there was a new standard that was approved towards the end of last year, C++17. Uh, there's a plan for another one in, uh, in 2020, which they're calling C++20 already, not C++2X. So they're, they're kind of, to some extent, saying, we will get this out in 2020. All right, so up to, on to C++11. Uh, so, a few new features. First of all, range-based form views. Uh, so, in C++, pre-C++11, you often wanted to iterate over some kind of data structure. Now, if it's an array or a vector, then that's okay. You could do the for int i equals zero, semicolon i, et cetera, et cetera. That wasn't too bad. But if it was something more complicated, like a set or a linked list or so on, well, you needed to use iterators. And Iterators are nice, but you had to write a lot of boilerplate code. Uh, so I have to repeat the name of my type up here, for one thing. Uh, and then I have to say equals city, so again, not equal, or while it's not equal to cities.end, i++. Plus plus. And then maybe I don't want to use star i inside of, the, uh, inside of the loop, so I can give a name to the thing that, is, uh, that that iterator is pointing to by using a reference. Well, in C++11, that's much simpler. We can now say for, I give a name to this variable, the thing that's going to refer to or uh, even get a copy of whatever's in my set, my list, my map, and so on. And I can just refer to it directly. So for my variable colon, and then the thing that that variable's coming from, whether that's a, uh, whether that's a, linked list or set or whatever, uh, it works the same way. Uh, and actually this also works with plain arrays too. So if I make a character array that contains the name of the creator of C++, I can loop over that using the same syntax. 
uh, it, there's actually a, uh, a function called begin and end, which is defined for things with iterators, also defined for arrays that does the right thing. And then this uh, syntax is really just syntactic sugar for something very much like this. It's just a shorthand. Uh, in the standard, it says this is exactly equal to something very similar to that. Uh, and that loop variable, so in the previous slide I showed a const reference, but it can be anything. It can be a uh, call by or a call by value, so just a plain variable, so I'm getting a copy of the character. Uh, it can be a non-const reference, so I actually get a reference to the character itself, which I can change. So this loop is going to go through this array and replace every character with an asterisk. Uh, now, one disadvantage of this compared to kind of the more general kind of for loop is I don't have any actual access to the iterator itself. It gives me access to the elements, not to the iterator. So if I need to know not just this is, uh, this is the letter capital S, but I need to know this is the letter capital S and it's at position zero, then maybe range-based for loops aren't what I need. And I could use just the traditional kind of for loop Maybe I can have a new variable inside of here that I use as a counter, uh, but the syntactic sugar doesn't really give me that. All right, so on to the next thing, type inference with auto. Um, that was the first picture of an automobile I found. Uh, so in C++11, and even more in later versions of C++, we can automatically infer the types of things. So for example, I've got this vector of animal. So normally, or in old C++, I could write something like this, animal, and then this is my, the name of my variable, equals something. Well, I, I'm kind of repeating myself here. I'm writing the word animal several times. Really, I don't need to. In C++11, I can write auto, and assuming the right-hand side has a well-defined type, and it is better, otherwise I'm probably not going to be able to compile it at all, but assuming it does have a well-defined type, the compiler can kind of automatically decide what that type on the left-hand side should be. So I can use this for variables. C++11 supported this for variables. Uh, and I can use it for things that I really don't want to type, like those iterators we saw. Sometimes I still do need a raw iterator. And I really don't want to have to type std colon colon vector or angle bracket animal colon colon iterator when I can just say auto. Now this might, uh, this might lead to a little more confusion if the person reading your program doesn't know the language that well, but it also, I think, makes things a lot more, a lot more readable in many places. Uh, and in C++14 got even better, we can now use auto return types for functions. Uh, you can actually do this with some very simple functions in C++11, but basically only the ones that cons whose body consisted of a single return statement, and that's it, which doesn't cover most functions, so it wasn't very useful. But now in C++11, I can say auto, the name of my function, and uh, the compiler will look at the return statements of my function. They had better all return to the same type, and if they do, it will figure out that that's the return type of the function. Now, auto as a return type of a function like this, might not be a good idea. It might be better for me to explicitly say this returns a double. Uh, maybe someone might expect it to return a float instead of a double. But for a function that has, say, template parameters that might depend on some other type and so on, this lets us write things that otherwise would be really, really complex to write. Uh, and there are some C++ programmers, uh, including some members of the standards committee, are advocating kind of a new way to declare your variables, which they call almost always auto, where basically you try to as much as possible use auto, and then you put the type on the right-hand side of the equal sign. Sometimes you could leave it out like this, five. Uh, sometimes you might explicitly write it like std colon colon string. Uh, and uh, depending, on, uh, depending on your thoughts on this, it might be, kind of a nice way to make everything more consistent, or it might just be a way to make things uglier. Yeah? What's the S after the, after the quote? Ah, so this is another feature that I'm not going to get into uh, in too much detail, but I wanted to scatter around a few new C++ features. Uh, so this is now a way in C++ 14 and up uh, to write a literal for a string. 
not for a character array like this one, but for an actual C++ member of the string class or uh, instance of the string class. So this is basically the same thing as the line above it. All right, so on to something else, lambdas. Um, probably most, many people in this room weren't born, uh, weren't born yet in 1990 and don't remember these movies, but there are actually two movies about this lambda dance in the 1990s, both were complete failures. Uh, but the lambda, without that A, uh, well, lambda is uh, basically an anonymous function. Uh, so tied into the lambda calculus that Owen was talking about. Um, they're a way to have a function without a name that can capture variables uh, from the scope that function or that anonymous function that lambda was defined in. And this is something that uh, you might think, well, why do I need it? Well, in C++ and C, you can't have nested functions. You can't define a function inside of another function. Uh, that would cause too many questions about what happens when the outer function returns if you can still refer to the inner function. Lambdas try to provide a good definition for what that means. So they're commonly used with the standard library algorithms where uh, you, you need to pass a function that, for example, here says which elements of, or what predicate do I want to find elements in this vector that match, rather than having to write that as a separate function or as a class with an overloaded uh, function call operator, I can use a lambda like this. So the syntax looks kind of kind of ugly. Uh, it doesn't actually have the letter lambda in it because we still want to be able to write things in ASCII. Uh, so the square brackets tell us what variables from the outside scope do we want to capture. So uh, min value here. Uh, and I have different ways of writing uh, that I want to capture this by value or by reference, or I want to capture all the variables that I'm using, or I want to capture them all by reference. Parentheses are just normal function parameters. And then the return type in order to make this possible to parse and not get confused with other things, the return type comes at the end. So we have that arrow and then the return type. And then finally, the body of the function, which can be anything that you would normally have in a function body. Can the return type be auto? Can the return type be auto? Uh, in C++ 11, it can't be, or it can only be in some very, very special cases. In C++ 14, it can, but rather than writing auto, you just leave out this part. Now that is a bit of a difficulty though, because in C++11, if you left this out and it's not one of those rare cases where it can automatically infer the return type, it would assume it's void. So that's one place where you can have a function or where you can have some code that has completely different meaning between C++11 and C++14. And most compilers, when they're in C++11 mode, will give you a warning about that and tell you, hey, in C++14, this is going to have a different meaning. So you might want to put in arrow void explicitly. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, another thing, so those were kind of all ease of use features. I mean, okay, maybe lambdas aren't the kind of thing you think of as being easy to use, but it lets you do things that, in a more easy way than you were able to uh, earlier in C++. ConstExpr is one of the new features that's designed for performance. Uh, so const expert stands for constant expression. It, you're telling the compiler that, you, that it can do something at compile time rather than run time. Uh, now, of course, compilers could previously do lots of things at compile time rather than run time. Uh, that was a function of the optimizer, but you pass different optimization flags and all of a sudden it's happening at run time. Const expert says, no, really, I really want this to happen at compile time. Uh, so you're trading off how long it takes to compile something versus how fast it runs. Uh, by making something const expert, well, really, you can make our compilation arbitrarily slow. I could have it calculate, uh, I've seen programs that calculate a picture of a Mandelbrot set using const expert. So it all happens at compile time, it takes minutes or hours to compile, but it runs instantly. Um, so in C++11, you could have const expr uh, variables, uh, and you could have some const expr functions, but again, only the really simple ones that had a single return statement and nothing else. Well, in C++14, uh, they started allowing much more complicated functions. Instead of, here's a list of the things you are allowed to use, it's now, here's a list of the things you're not allowed to use, which are 
uh, things that are very machine specific, doing input, output, that kind of thing. Uh, so here's an example of a const expert function. This is one that would work in C11 as well. Uh, you'll notice it's recursive. Uh, it has to have, be a single return statement, uh, so I can't have a loop or an id in C11. In C14, I could write it in a more natural way. But this is, uh, this is const expert function that computes a vectorial. Uh, so I could run something like this. Uh, here I'm making a const expert variable. And at compile time, the size of this, vari or this variable's value will be known to be 6 billion something. And that's useful because I could use that, if I know it at compile time, I can use it as something like the uh, size of an array. In C++, unless it's dynamically allocated, you have to know the size of, array, of an array at compile time. With const expert, I can calculate the size of the array, assuming it's based only on other things I know at compile time. Now, if I have a variable that is not const expert, I can still call my const expert function, but this is now happening at runtime. There's no way it can know at compile time what the value of x is, so it has to wait until runtime to figure it out there. And in fact, if I tried to make this x factorial a const expert variable, my compiler would give me an error. It would say that uh, you're calling the factorial function, which is const expert, but you're giving it a parameter that's not, or you're giving it an argument that's not, so I don't know what the value is going to be. I can't compute it at compile time. Yeah? What relation does constexpr have to inline? Because theoretically, that last you could have an inline factorial, so inline can show that value. Yeah, so inline in C++ is actually kind of a misleadingly named uh, misleadingly named thing, because inline does not guarantee that something will actually be inline, nor does the lack of inline guarantee that it won't be inline. Uh, it's also often not even used by the compiler as a suggestion. The big, the actual semantic meaning of inline, according to the C++ standard, is that you're allowed to violate the one definition rule, the, the rule that you can only have that you can only have one definition of a given function. Uh, uh, there is, though, a relationship. Const expert functions are automatically inline, uh, which also, also, uh, I should mention that really this definition of a function, unless you're using it in a single source code file, uh, so if you wanted to use it in multiple places, the definition would have to be in the header, because otherwise the compiler, when it's compiling foo.cc, isn't going to know what the definition of the function is, and it's not going to be able to do that at compile time. Uh, that usually doesn't happen at link time, just at compile time. All right, so moving on to the one last thing. So these are, this is move semantics. Uh, so in C++, in C++ prior to C++11, there was this, um, sometimes this, struggle to define a function in a way that made it maximally usable but also maximally efficient. So as an example, think of a function that takes a string and that function needs to make some modifications to the string. We don't care whether those modifications are reflected in the caller, but uh, we need to do it internally. Maybe, for example, we want to count the number of instances of each letter and as part of the algorithm we're going to use for that involves first sorting the function. Uh, or first sorting the, the characters of the string. So uh, if I don't want to make copies, maybe I want to use a, uh, an in-place sorting algorithm, meaning I can't take a constant. Uh, so in C++ 98 and 03, I had three options there, one of which doesn't work. Uh, I can do call by value, which requires making a copy of the string to pass on to my function, uh, which works, but can be kind of expensive, uh, particularly if I'm making a copy of something I'm never going to need again. I, I now have two copies. Why couldn't I just use the original since I don't care about it anymore? I can use call by reference, so pass it a reference to the screen. That will modify the original, but maybe I don't care about that. But the problem is I can't pass a temporary. I can't pass, quote, hello world, quote, s, or something like that. Or I can't pass uh, string one plus string two as the argument. I can only take a reference, or at least the old style of reference, I can only take a reference to something that either has a name or has a location in memory or something like that. And I could make it take a const reference, which does get around that problem. Const references do work for temporaries, but then I can't modify my argument, so I might end up having to make a copy of it anyway inside my file. 
Uh, well, C++11 and, uh, gives us a different way to do this, another option, uh, which are move semantics. Instead of making a copy of my original, I'm going to move my original into the new variable. Often, for example, with a string class, that will involve just moving a pointer, changing a pointer or taking a pointer in one data structure and putting that pointer in another data structure. So they're pointing, well, they would be pointing to the same thing, but I know that original data structure is going away. Because uh, when I use this, it's usually with temporaries or with other kinds of things that I know are going away. Uh, and that does mean the data is lost from its original location, but again, I don't usually care. Uh, according to the standard, the original, when I move from, uh, move from a variable or move from an object, is left in a valid but unspecified state. Uh, meaning, uh, well, we're not saying what it has in it, but it's not going to crash when you try to use it. Um, and most of the standard data structures in C++ do support move semantics. So uh, you can move strings, you can move vectors, you can move linked lists, you can move maps, and so on. Uh, if you want to use move semantics yourself in your own data structure, what you need uh, are a move constructor, just like the copy constructor that you're used to, and a move assignment operator, just like the assignment operator you're used to, which is now called a copy assignment operator. So let's say I have a class like this. I'm, I'm implementing my own string class because I don't know why, but I am for the sake of example. Uh, and my string class has a pointer to some data. I don't want different strings to share the same data, so my copy constructor would have to make a copy of the data that I'm pointing to, and to do that, I also need to know how long it is. Um, so if I want to add move semantics to this class, I need to implement, uh, first of all, the move constructor. So this is taking a weird kind of reference or a new kind of reference called an R value reference. This is a reference that can bind to a temporary, and actually only to a temporary. Uh, I can't call this by giving it a variable name. I have to write some kind of expression that gives me a temporary. There's a way to do, uh, there's a way to say, turn this into a temporary. Um, and so what am I doing here? Well, my data is just going to be the other thing's data. This is just a pointer assignment, so, or a pointer initialization. So I'm not actually copying anything other than the pointer itself. And my length is the other thing's length. But I also have to make sure that I and that other thing aren't pointing at the same data. Otherwise, when my destructor gets called, or its destructor gets called, uh, the other one would get messed up. So I need to, for example, maybe set the other thing's uh, data pointer to a null pointer and say the other thing has length zero. Uh, that's assuming this class can handle the case where, uh, where the data pointer is a null pointer. Otherwise, maybe I have to allocate memory for the other thing or something. Uh, I also want to move the assignment operator, and the usual way you do this is just by swapping. So I swap my data pointer for the other thing's data pointer, because with an assignment operator, I already have a data pointer. Uh, my object already exists, this other object already exists, we'll just swap them around. So that's part of that valid but unspecified state. I'm leaving the other object, the one that's getting moved from, in some state that's valid. It's actually the state that I used to have. Uh, and then I'll do the same thing with the length. And I don't want just the move operator, so really, in most cases, I also want to have a copy constructor, a copy assignment operator, so the ones that take a const reference. That way I can either copy this thing or I can move this thing. There are a few cl built-in classes in C++ 11 and up that have only uh, move constructors, and they're things that are explicitly intended not to be copied. All right, so that's all that I'm going to talk about as far as the language goes. Uh, here are some books you might want to look at. Uh, when I send the slides around, you'll be able to see the list of these and what they're about, and also some online material if you're interested in learning more about modern C++. CPPCon is an annual conference. They post all of their videos to YouTube. Uh, starts starting during the conference and extending for uh, several weeks after the conference. Uh, definitely take a look uh, take a look at those. These are some of my favorite speakers from the conference, but you might find others. Uh, CPP reference website, not C++.com. There are often a lot of errors in that one. CPP reference though is great. It's very, very technical, not quite as technical as reading the standard, but still pretty technical, 
but it does at least have examples for everything, and it indicates all the changes, so you know, did this work in C++11 or C++14, and so on. And then finally, if you're really, really interested in writing a C++ compiler, you need to take a look at the standard. The actual standard costs money, but the standards committee releases their working drafts for free. So uh, if you go to this website, it will say, I click here to buy the standard. Oh, by the way, here's the link to the last working draft. The last working draft from last year was in March. The standard actually came out September or October, so there are a few months worth of missing things, but nothing major. Uh, and again, if you want to actually read this, I really hope you like standard ease, because it's all standard ease all the way through. So thanks a lot, and I'll take any questions. Like to leave, certainly, if you, you may. Um, questions, yes. I just 